Welcome back to another episode of Gatehouse Insights. And today, I'm joined by Hugh McKay. Hugh is going to dive deeper into the kindness revolution, how we can accept what we can't control, social life isolation, and much, much more. Make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel where you can see it all. afternoon for you. Thank you very much, Louise. It's a pleasure to meet you via Zoom. Yes. And congratulations on your recent the book launch of The Kindness Revolution. Um, it was a book you've written in lockdown last year. Um, what book number is this? Because I know you've written many, many books. Uh, well, yes, it's number 22. <laughs> <laughs> Eight of those are novels, but um, fourteen are nonfiction. I think this is probably my last, my last, certainly my last major nonfiction book. Yeah, I think I've said everything I want to say about this. <laughs> well, you never know. So no, you never know exactly. Yes, yes. So I, I, wonder- I, didn't, I didn't think I'd write this one, but then the publisher said we'd like you to do a kind of wrap-up book using the events of 2020 as a jumping off point and that made a lot of sense so I did it. Fantastic well it's I'm glad you did because there's lots of um, insight and wisdom in that book which we're going to unpack a little bit more of but uh, I highly recommend anyone buying the book. Um, So I really want to begin with your saying that everyone is in need of kindness which we are and because everyone walks with shadows but how can we be kinder to each other every day when we are walking with our own shadows and it can be really hard? Yeah, there's no doubt it can be really hard. Um, I think we just need to take a step back to answer this question properly and just to remind ourselves that we humans belong to a social species. We're hopeless in isolation. We need each other. And neuroscientists who can now peep into our brains and see what's actually going on in a way that psychologists could previously just speculate about. They say you can find the cooperative center in the human brain, that we're actually hardwired to be sociable, to be cooperative, which means we're hardwired for the qualities we need for cooperation, which are kindness, compassion, care for others, mutual respect, and so on. So... At the essence of our nature, we are we're kind creatures. At the essence of our nature, we live for others. Uh, we, we recognize that our job as members of this social species is to create what humans need in order to thrive, which is a harmonious society. We need families, neighborhoods, groups, communities of all kinds to nurture us and sustain us, and to give us that all-important sense of belonging, which is so fundamental to our mental and emotional health. Now, that sounds like a long way around to answering your question, but bearing all of that in mind, what that means is that when we are true to ourselves, we are responsive to the needs of other people because that's what it means to be human. And we acknowledge that all those people walk with shadows as we do. But the key to kindness is the discipline of switching the focus from my own concerns to the concerns of others. Now, we won't always succeed in that. I mean, the ego gets in the way. We, we, we can become very self-absorbed. We can get caught up in our own misery. We can get caught up in our own ambition or our own competitiveness or our own acquisitiveness, all those things can distract us from our innate capacity for kindness. So it does require some discipline, Louise. I mean, you're quite right to say it. You know, it doesn't, doesn't come that easily because we have our own shadows to contend with. And by the way, I'm not suggesting we ignore those. I think we all need every day uh, little moments for of solitude, for for reflection and uh, for for being kind to ourselves. 
um, not in a self-indulgent way, but simply to equip us to, to top up our resources for this rather demanding thing of being a member of a social species. Yeah. I think some people would prefer to belong to a species that consisted of solitary hermits, but that's not us. It's certainly not. Now, you also talk about the emotional palette and you, you say that we need this cycle and we need to experience all the moods to make us fully human. I was hoping you could unpack that a little bit because I know for me, especially, I don't want to experience all the, I don't want to experience the whole emotional palette, especially the difficult ones. So could you unpack that? Because I know a lot of people probably feel the same as me. Yeah. Well, and I feel the same. I mean, who welcomes sadness? Who goes looking for disappointment and loss and failure? None of us. Um, but I do think we have to recognise that being a human walking this earth entails sadness, disappointment, loss, failure, all those things. And they're all part of, yes, what you describe as the emotional palette. Uh, they're all part of the range of human emotions, all of which have important lessons to teach us and none of which would make any sense without the others. So, for example, it's become rather fashionable to focus on happiness as if happiness is a suitable goal for living, as though what we should strive for is to be happy all the time. Uh, and if we can't achieve it by the, 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 the events of our normal daily life, well, we might uh, take some drugs to induce it artificially. Um, I mean, that's what the drug culture is really about. The, sh the shortcut to happiness. Well, this is madness. The idea that we should strive to be happy is as crazy as the idea that we should strive to be sad. And yet, if you're going to say, look, the goal of my life is to be happy, then I'd have to say to you, well, you'll only know what happiness is if, you, if you've experienced sadness, so you better go out looking for some sad things to happen <laughs> so you can enjoy happiness. Well, of course, we don't have to do that, it just comes to us. Yeah. But here's, the, here's the, the really significant thing about this point, Louise, which is it's been buried in our folklore forever, this proposition that we grow through pain. And I think most of us reflecting on our lives would say, the painful episodes, the difficult episodes, the times when unexpected events crashed into our lives and disrupted us and shattered our complacency and so on. We didn't like any of that happening. We didn't like a pandemic coming. People don't like a war or a depression and individuals don't like relationship breakdowns and retrenchments and all those things that happened to us. But looking back, we can often see how having to deal with hardship, deprivation, pain, loss, is what has built our resilience, is what our, has built our capacity to cope with the vicissitudes of life. And everyone's life will consist of brightness and darkness and ups and downs and so on. So I think it's just a matter of saying not, boy, I'm hoping I'm going to be disappointed today because that'll build my resilience, but to accept that when these things happen to us, they are part of the full range of the learning experiences we need to teach us what it means to be human, and in particular, to teach us what it means to be Louise. You, you won't know until you've come up against the things that you don't welcome into your life. That's, that's very true. You have another saying in your book that we need to accept that we can't control life seasons, but we can control our responses. And I really love this because sometimes we don't stop and think about how we can control our responses or even our actions. We just do. Yes. So could you share your thoughts on how we can better control our responses to whether it's a person or a situation? Yeah. Here again, we're talking about a self-discipline. I mean, what, what is easiest for, to, for us to do is simply 
uh, fly off the handle if someone says something that annoys us uh, or get angry if we're feeling a bit irritated and uh, and just react without without reflecting on it. Now, I think when, when we do face um, a situation that's bringing out a negative response in us, first of all, I mean, there, there, are, two, there are two reactions. If we're interested in the, what I think of as the goal of human life, which is to make the world a better place, uh, to build a more socially harmonious kind of society, um, because that's how we all thrive, if that's the case, then there are two things I think we can say about about um, our responses to particularly the dark passages of life. One is whatever's happening to us, whatever interaction we're having that's difficult, we are going to make it less painful for ourselves and the other people involved if we remember that everything can be dealt with kindly. We can terminate a relationship kindly. Mm. Um, we can terminate someone's employment kindly. We can discipline a child kindly. We can have a robust argument with someone about religion or politics or art or music or anything kindly. Uh, kindness is not a sort of a soft option. You can be very tough and kind. You can speak your mind kindly. So I think that's, that's the first discipline. Uh, just to remember that however riled up I'm feeling, hang on, I just need to pause and for those few nanoseconds, just remind myself, stay kind. Because if I stay kind, I'm probably going to stay calm. I mean, if I lose my temper, I lose the argument. If I lose my temper, the situation is out of control. By staying calm and kind we actually retain some control of the situation. But the other thing, uh, and this is perhaps harder, but not completely unrealistic. The other thing is to recognize that all the experiences that happen to us are learning experiences. So when we are dealing with something that's difficult, where our response is understandably negative, we just need, again, that little discipline, that little moment of introspection that says, I can learn from this. And it's a discipline that you can, you can apply. I mean, I've, I've heard people talking about how it works for them, that in a difficult workplace situation, for example, or in a difficult uh, episode with a partner or uh, with a friend or a colleague, uh, the people are able to say, I'm learning something from this. No, no experience is wasted. Uh, we are learning from it. And that can temper our response a bit. Yeah. The main thing is just to, just to remember that our default position is kindness, even when we're in a negative situation. And if we stick to that, if we make that our, uh, our default position, if we, if we are... Um, determined to express what we want to say, but kindly, it'll have a huge, it won't only have a huge effect on the person we're dealing with, it'll have a huge effect on us. Mm. It's very true. And I suppose it's an, an, a habit for some of us that we need to build on and implement every day um, because it is easy just to respond and act but stopping and thinking and reminding ourselves to act kindly can be quite challenging if we have never done it before. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, you also talk about one of our biggest needs is being heard and actually listening is, is an act of kindness. Mm -hmm. Why is being heard one of our deepest needs? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what actually happens when we feel we're not being heard and listened to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, right back to a, the, the very beginning of our conversation, Louise, um, where I said, let's remember that we belong to a social species. We need each other. We're hopeless in isolation. We need the support and the nurture of family, friends, colleagues, groups, communities, neighbourhoods, etc. What that means is that one of our deepest social needs 
is the need uh, not just to belong, but to be accepted, uh, to feel as though there. Well, it is it's closely connected to belong. To feel as though there's somewhere you belong because you are accepted by the people you work with, um, by the people you live with, or by your neighbours or whoever it is. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's fundamental to the well-being of a member of a social species. We must feel as though we've been noticed. We're not overlooked. We're not on the margin. We're included. Uh, we're appreciated. We're acknowledged. Uh, we're heard. And if we don't feel those things, this will bring out the worst in us. Because for a social, for a member of a social species, not to feel as though they are not appreciated, not noticed, not acknowledged, not accepted, not included, is very alienating, very frustrating, and that can lead to feelings of high anxiety, depression, all the way through to really antisocial responses like violence. I'm determined to get back at these people who are ignoring me. Um, it's it's that's very often the motivation for antisocial behaviour all the way up to violence. The feeling that, okay, I'll make you take notice of me. <laughs> you know, cop this. Uh, now, this is not a not a not an enlightened response. But it's a very easy response to understand for someone who's experiencing that frustration. Now, we live at a point in our history, pre-pandemic, where many of the social trends which have been reshaping our society, things like our shrinking households, our high rate of relationship breakdown, our falling birth rate, our increased mobility, um, our increased busyness, and certainly our enthusiastic embrace of information technology when it's at the expense of face-to-face -face encounters, all of those things together have, been, have had an effect which has been observed not just in Australia but around Western societies of um, societies becoming more fragmented of people feeling more like individuals, of social cohesion being eroded and social isolation becoming a major problem. And we can talk about that at, at more length um, perhaps later, but where, where you have a problem of social isolation, you have an increased likelihood of loneliness, uh, depression, anxiety, et cetera. So those are all consequences of people not feeling included, not feeling as if they belong, not feeling as if they are part of this, what I've described in the book as the shimmering, vibrating web of interconnectedness mm -hmm. that we all belong. If you don't feel as if you're part of that web, it's a very, very lonely feeling. And by the way, 25 pre-pandemic, the figure is higher now, but pre-pandemic, 25% of Australians reported feeling lonely. Mm -hmm. Most of Australian adults yeah. reported feeling lonely most of the time. Now that's a that's a symptom of a society in which too many people did not feel as if they were being heard, accepted, included. Yeah. Do you know what the figure is now, or has that? Data not being released. Uh, that, that was a major piece of research that the Australian Psychological Society and Swinburne Uni did in 2019. Mm. So all I know is that anecdotally, more people have experienced, well, we know more people have experienced social isolation due to lockdowns. Therefore, we can assume that the adverse consequences, uh, and in particular, the feeling of Am I, does anyone know I'm here? Am I, am I being acknowledged? Am I being appreciated? Yeah. Those questions uh, arise more during a lockdown, of course. That's why right. we talk about the lockdown as uh, creating a potential mental health crisis. Yes. In terms of, I mean, pre-pandemic and even more so 
I mean, being in self-isolated and being in lockdowns, it's it's harder to connect with people. But say pre-pandemic and even post-pandemic, post all these lockdowns, what can an individual do to, I suppose, if they're feeling a bit lonely and feeling like they're not being heard, what can they do to, I suppose, voice it? Because some people are, are shy and they don't want to voice their concerns yeah. or they're not, they don't want to share their thoughts or whatever it might be. But yeah. For those individuals, what can they do to help them not feel so isolated and lonely? Yes. Um, Even before I answer that question, Louise, I'd like to say that the main responsibility for the epidemic of loneliness in our society lies with people who are not lonely. Mm. Those of us who feel connected and included and as if we are being taken seriously, I think we have a social, a moral responsibility to look around us. Is there someone, even in our workplace, is there someone in our neighbourhood at risk of being socially isolated? Have we been ignoring a neighbour who lives alone and haven't seen them for a while or I don't even bother to cross the street and say good day occasionally? It's it's the responsibility of the non-lonely to reach out. Yeah. Uh, with acts of kindness and inclusion towards lonely people. But if people are themselves feeling lonely and obviously wanting not to because it's a disease, it's an unhealthy situation to be in, um, the, the, um, as you say, many people are shy about saying, gee, I really feel lonely. Would you come and have a cup of tea with me? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's very easy to say, would you come and have a cup of tea with me? Not because I feel lonely. In other words, we can turn the whole thing around and say, uh, if a a lonely person reaches out to perform an act of kindness for someone else, suddenly they're not lonely. Mm -hmm. Loneliness can become a state of self-absorption. We can become so concerned about the fact that we are feeling socially isolated that we overlook the possibility that by going out and making contact with doing something kind for a neighbour, stopping or, or listening to someone at a bus stop who wants to talk to us, suddenly we're not lonely. It's a matter of being uh, switching the focus. I, 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 I know I have a problem, but just for the moment, I won't focus on that problem. I'll look around and see if someone else has got a problem, mm-hmm. particularly someone in my street yeah. who might be like I am, a bit socially, I so maybe I go across to them and I don't say, gee, I'm feeling lonely. I bet you must be too. If we talk to each other, we won't be lonely. <laughs> it needs to be a bit more subtle than that. Uh, we simply say, you know, I, I just picked some lemons. Would you like some? Or I'm going down to the local cafe for a cup of coffee. I wonder if you want to join me. I'd be happy to shout you a cup of coffee. Just little, little acts of kindness. Uh, will take the focus off our own concern about feeling lonely and switch it on to someone else's need that we could respond to. Nothing nothing eases the mind Mm. like shifting the focus from our needs to the needs of other people. Mm. When, I mean, there's that issue of, of being lonely, you know, not living with someone What about if we are in a relationship and, you know, we're living in a household full of people or, you know, we're we're with a partner or whatever it might be, and we still feel lonely in that sense? What can we do to, I suppose, communicate that we are feeling lonely to to people living in our house? Yeah, and and what you've described is a very real problem, Louise. I mean, it's loneliness we often think of as, involving social isolation, but it is possible for people to feel intensely lonely in a crowded house Mm. uh, or in a workplace that's buzzing with life and activity because they feel um, a bit overlooked or underappreciated or ignored or not listened to. Um, Again, the, the solution is maybe not in that house where they might find it very hard to say, hey, what about me? Uh, but even then, it may be possible for them to see someone else in the in the household who's in need and respond to that need or to look elsewhere mm-hmm. for people who do need acts of kindness and a bit of companionship and so on and to offer that, even as a volunteer in a 
in a charitable organisation that takes meals to socially isolated people or you know, anything yeah. that will create a connection uh, that will ease that feeling of loneliness. And, of course, once people start to conquer the problem of loneliness in themselves, then they find it easier to integrate in that crowded house, for example, um, where they previously felt lonely. If they're addressing the problem of loneliness somewhere else, it's less likely to be a problem even there. Mm. And they're more likely to feel confident enough to say, hey, you know, you've talked to everyone except me. I'm here. Yeah. And I suppose as individuals who maybe aren't feeling lonely, what can we do to better listen to someone and also, um, you know, making them feel heard and, and included? What can we do for, for those people that aren't feeling self-isolated, lonely, but what can they do to help others? Hmm. Well, it's interesting you mentioned uh, listening to them because I think that's that that goes to the heart of this conversation. If you said to me, what's the single most potent act of kindness I can perform for another person, ruling out helping someone out when they're really in a jam, you know, and it's urgent, but in normal everyday interactions with other people, the single most potent thing I can do to express my kindness is to listen yeah. attentively and empathically to another person. Listening is the loveliest gift we ever give each. I mean, you're doing it now. You know, you're you're listening to me. And for me, that's a source of enormous affirmation and encouragement because I can see from the look on your face and your general attentiveness that you're actually interested in what I'm going to say, which is a wonderful uh, experience for any of us to have. Wow, somebody is prepared to listen. Um, listening says, without having to put it into words, listening says, I'm taking you seriously enough to bother listening to what you're saying. But notice the converse. If we don't listen, if we're too impatient to listen or if we're not really attentive and we're looking around in the hope of catching sight of someone a bit more interesting to talk to or we're glancing at our watch all the time, what we're conveying, again, without having to put it into words, we are conveying to that person, sorry, I don't take you seriously enough to bother listening to you. Now, we'd never say that explicitly, would we, to a partner or a child or a colleague or a friend, or a neighbour, sorry, I don't take you seriously enough to bother, but if I don't listen, that's actually what I'm saying. Now, I don't pretend for a moment that listening comes easily. I mean, it is, it is, it is the loveliest of all the acts of kindness that we can perform because people's need to be heard is so profound, but it doesn't come easily because... We often hear stuff that bothers us, or we hear stuff that irritates us, or we hear stuff that uh, contradicts what we think. Uh, um, uh, we hear stuff we could never agree with. Well, here's the big challenge for the person who's decided to live more kindly. I am not qualified to disagree with you until I've heard you out. I'm not qualified to jump in with my own prejudices and my own point of view until I've entertained yours, until I've understood what you're saying. And then I can demonstrate to you, well, Louise, I guess what you're saying is X, Y, Z. Yeah, well, I, I get that. Now, I have a different view. And then I'm entitled to express my different view. But jumping in, as we so often do, and contradicting people or talking across them, we're, we're not entitled to do that. We haven't heard what they want to say yet. Uh, and and, and it, it, receive before you react is one of the fundamental rules of the kind, attentive listener. The cutting off um, someone else in a conversation, that drives me insane. And um, 
coming from a European family, it's quite often over the dinner table, everyone's cutting each other off. So it's, and it can be quite frustrating. And then you feel like I'm not obviously um, overly loud compared to others in, in my family. So, but it, it can feel like, oh, they're not listening to me. My opinions aren't valid. They're cutting me off. They think I know what I'm going to say. So I, I can, I suppose, yeah, feel that that emotion at times or that feeling. Yes. Oh, yes. And, I mean, we see it in the media all the time, journalists asking a question and then interrupting before the answer has been given because they don't like the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think this is, this is a breakthrough moment in the conversation, Louise, because <laughs> we're, we're talking about a skill that we can all master. And it's, the skill, and, and it's based on a recognition of the fact that we all exist in a kind of mind cage. And the mind cage, we, we build it because we feel comfortable and safe and secure inside this framework um, of beliefs and attitudes and convictions and preconceptions and values and prejudices, all these things that we've we've put together through our lives. And we at a, at a given point, here we are inside this, you could think of it as a cocoon, I think of it as a cage. Um, and the point about it is, it's so comfortable inside our own little mind cage, mm -hmm. that we are reluctant, understandably, we're reluctant to step outside and be open to what we're hearing. But if we don't, then everything we see and hear will be filtered through the bars of our mind cage. You know, we're, um, we, we, that, that's why people interrupt. I can't stand what you're hearing. It doesn't fit with what I think. So I'm going to tell you what I think. Uh, or we mishear, you know, we misremember. We perceive things selectively so they fit with the convictions and the preconceptions that we already have. So a big part of the discipline of attentive and empathic listening is that we should be prepared to abandon, just briefly, we can scurry back any time we like, but briefly to abandon the comfort and security of our own mind cage. The American psychotherapist Carl Rogers, who's a bit of a hero of mine, he talked about needing the courage to listen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true. And we need courage because to truly listen to someone means we're going to run the risk of having to change our minds in response to what we hear. And no one likes having to change their minds. But unless you're taking that risk, you're not really listening. Yeah. Now, I, I'm noticing a lot more people are speaking about it. This is the new normal. Yes. Um, and I, I think every second person I'm saying to you, oh, this is the new normal, this is the new normal. And can you unpack for us what you think the new normal is and how is this actually going to affect our personal relationships with other people? Hmm. Yeah, it's a huge question because everyone has their own meaning of that of that um, ubiquitous phrase, the new normal. And what they often mean is we're going to try to live the way we used to live, but with uh, acknowledging that COVID is still amongst us and um, we're going to have to make adjustments to that and we're going to have to be ready for keeping our distance or wearing a mask or working from home or something in ways that we didn't previously. What I'm hoping the new normal means. And what it means for me is that coming through the pandemic, and we're not through it yet, but when we do come through it, we will have been reminded of some very important lessons about what it means to be human. We'll have been reminded of the fact that we are interdependent. We are absolutely interconnected. The virus knows that. The virus is attacking our species, not just women between the ages of 31 and 38, or Buddhists or um, people who live on the coastal fringe. No, no, um, it's the species. We are interconnected. Um, uh, and so we're reminded of that. I think we're also reminded by, by our natural response to the pandemic that kindness comes naturally. We've been kinder 
to each other. We've been kinder on a large scale. We've worn masks, yeah, sure, to protect ourselves, but to protect each other. It's an act of kindness. Staying at home is an act of kindness. Um, uh, so I think we've learned that that kindness is the truly human virtue, but also that we must make sacrifices for the common good. Yeah. But it's not all about me. That you know the, the flowering of the me culture, which was happening really before the pandemic arrived, I think that flower has been crushed. And we've recognised it's not all about me. We have to reappraise the importance of the neighbourhood, the community, um, society at large and our place in it. Now, to me, the new normal is living in the light of those lessons. that we've, we, We're taught those lessons by various experiences, but on a large and dramatic scale, we've been taught those lessons by the pandemic. So for me, and I hope this isn't absurdly optimistic, but for me, the new normal is living in the light of the lessons we've learned, uh, which is all about needing to take other people's well-being into account. I mean, I would hope, though this is a bit utopian, I would hope that as a result of living through the pandemic and embracing kindness as a way of life, on a large scale, that could even affect our political culture. Mm -hmm. It could affect how, as a society, we respond to refugees or to Indigenous people or to the frail elderly or how we address the widening uh, uh, gap between the privileged and the underprivileged in education as well as economically and so on. There's a, a long list of things where we'd be a better society if we adopted a kinder uh, disposition. So that, that would be part of my dream new normal. But I think even, even stopping short of that and just saying, well, let's, let's bring it back to our own front door. The new normal is me living in a new awareness of the fact that I belong in this community, that I have responsibilities to these other people, that I've had a tiny taste of social isolation, for example, and maybe that's made me a bit more sensitive to the people who are at risk of permanent social isolation. Yeah. On self-isolation, just coming back to that again, you mentioned that, you know, self-isolation is a greater th threat to public health than obesity. Could you discuss that a little bit? Because I think it's really important that we, we understand that a little bit more detail. Yes, yes. A number of psychologists around the Western world, including Australia, have been making this point, and it's a dramatic way of making it, that to say that social isolation is a greater threat to public health than obesity. We know what kind of a threat to public health obesity is because of all the other health consequences that flow from obesity and that require uh, attention from the public health system. So it's a huge cost mm -hmm. on society. Same as smoking is a huge cost on society, et cetera. Well, so is isolation because social isolation turns out to be associated with a long list of health hazards. I've mentioned a few earlier on. It's associated with an increased risk of loneliness, uh, which is an, an unhealthy state in itself, uh, an increased risk of anxiety and depression, both of which are very close relatives of loneliness. They're often associated with feelings of loneliness. But social isolation, extended social isolation, is also associated with an increased risk of hypertension, inflammation, disturbed sleep, cognitive decline, vulnerability to addiction. It's quite a long list uh, of, of health consequences that flow from social isolation. So there is an urgent need. I've heard many psychologists and social analysts of various kinds say our most urgent task is to address the problem of loss of social cohesion, mm -hmm. the problem of increasing social isolation because it's such an unhealthy state for people to slip into. 
Yeah. Do you think with the, um, I suppose, the advancements of technology and all the social media apps we have, we're going to lose more of that, I suppose, um, personal relationships with people? We're going to become more self-isolated in the future? Uh, no, I, I hope that the reverse will happen. I think that when we get a shock like this one, we get little disruptions and we recognise the health consequences of what we're doing. I mean, ma masses of people have given up smoking because they understand the health consequences. A lot of people uh, who are obese are working uh, to solve that problem because they know the health consequences. And I think as we, as a society, as we come to realise that being socially isolated is so unhealthy for us, I think we are going to address it. I mean, even in relation to uh, information technology, which seems as if it makes us more connected than ever before. Mm. Uh, I mean, even in this Zoom encounter that we're having, we feel as if we're looking at each other, but actually we're not. Mm. We're both looking at a screen. <laughs> uh, and that's about as different as it can be from actually being in the same room and making actual eye, I mean, eye contact is the magic thing about human interaction. And you can't make eye contact if you're not in the same place at the same time as someone else. So we need to recognize that our that information technology, which has been a lifesaver through the pandemic, we're able to do things like this um, when we can't actually get together and have a conversation and film it and so on. Uh, so it's brilliant. And it's saved the sanity of lots of people who would otherwise be feeling more socially isolated. But a huge warning bell uh, has been sounded for us by that research that I mentioned mm -hmm. from 2019, which showed that the highest level of loneliness, the, 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 the age group reporting the highest levels of loneliness are the 18 to 24 age group, who are also the heaviest users of social media. In other words, we've got this phenomenon of people being connected but lonely. Yeah. And that's not surprising because the form of connection is so different from face-to-face -face human interaction that you can have all the Zooming, all the texting, all the Instagram posting and everything in the world and still feel lonely. Yeah. 2020 has certainly given us and a lot of time for reflection and even obviously that reflection still continues in 2021 because some parts of the country are in lockdown. Do you think we are ready to apply the life lessons we've learnt during the pandemic? And do you think we're going to be able to sustain them forever or are we going to go back to our old ways? Yeah, um, that that is uh, the question, capital T, capital Q. <laughs> I was speaking recently to a retired American academic who had worked in London in the early 1950s, just a few years after the end of World War II. And he was initially shocked by the number of Londoners who said to him, you know, we really miss the war. Wow. And he thought, how could you possibly miss the war? And, of course, they weren't saying we miss the bombs, we miss the rubble, we miss, miss the death and destruction and disruption and all of that. What they were saying was we miss the solidarity. We miss the sense of people really pulling together and really looking out for each other. And if someone's in a jam, they just go and help them uh, without a backward glance, regardless of their own appalling situation. In other words, what they were saying was we were better as a people during the war than we are now that we've reverted to the kind of life we had um, pre-war. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that shocked him because you would think that something like a war would change people forever. But there, uh, at least some people were saying, well, it changed us for a while, but it didn't change us forever. We, we, we've lost that sense of solidarity and so on. So this is the big question, Louise. It has, has the pandemic, closely following on the heels of the bushfires, been enough of a disruption, enough of a fright to cause us to internalise these lessons we've been talking about and, and stick with them? Mm -hmm. Now, by contrast with that academic uh, and, and 
the story you told me about London. When I reflect on the members of the generation who were young adults raising families in the years of the Great Depression of the 1930s in Australia, I spoke to a lot of them in my research career, and they always said, I mean, not, not universally, but typically they said two things. First, that was the worst time of our lives. It was a time of absolutely terrible hardship and deprivation, unemployment like you couldn't imagine today, and it went on forever, years and years. We often wondered if we were going to be able to put a meal on the table for the kids, and often we were only able to because neighbours pitched in and pooled their resources and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it was awful. And then the second half of their story was, but you know, it was the making of us. We learned lessons about the need to look out for each other, uh, to contribute to the neighbourhood. We got our values straight. We got our priorities straight. And those lessons never left us. And we became a laughing stock in our family as being the people who would never throw out a piece of string and the people who would always bake a cake when a new neighbour moved into the street and go and make a little welcome speech and so on. Uh, but they were proud of that, of course. And they said it was the hardship that taught them the lessons that led uh, to, um, to them never letting go yeah. of those values. So we don't know. Because we've been living through 30 or 40 years of social change, pushing us in the opposite direction, making us more individualistic, more competitive, more materialistic, let's, let's be blunt, more selfish, um, has this, what might turn out to be a two-year experience of COVID-19, is this enough of a disruption in Melbourne, people are probably saying, yes, thanks, we've had quite enough of a disruption. Is it enough of a disruption for the effects to become permanent? Well, that's why I wrote the book. Let, what I'm really saying is let's turn the crisis into a revolution. Let's not just slip back into the way it was. Let's reflect on how we've behaved during this period because, generally speaking, people are saying we're quite proud of how we've behaved. We've done rather well. We have been kinder. We have been more considerate of other, other people. We have made sacrifices for the common good. We like that about ourselves. Well, wouldn't it be a tragedy? In fact, wouldn't it be rather pathetic if we just let all this go yeah. and went back to the way we were? So I have no idea whether it will stick, but I'm doing everything in my power to encourage people to make it stick. Which is incredible because I think it's it needs to stick. So time will tell. So yes. And before we close, you've listened to thousands of life stories over the years. Could you share your three biggest life lessons you've learned from these stories that you want our audience to take away? Yeah, that's a very big question um, because there are so many. But here I'll, I'll try to distill what I think are probably the most important three for us all to remember. I mean, I've been lucky enough to spend my life sitting in people's lounge rooms and on their back verandas and perched on their kitchen stools telling me their life stories and their opinions about every imaginable subject. But I, I, I'd say these, these three. Number one, everyone's story is interesting. I've never interviewed a person in my professional role as a researcher or had a conversation with a person just socially where I didn't learn something interesting about them. People say, you know, the unkindest thing people ever say, oh, he's so boring. Well, sorry, go and listen a bit more attentively. He's not boring. Everyone's story is interesting. And that's partly because, as we said earlier, Everyone walks with shadows. Everyone's had problems. Everyone has had to deal with tragedies and setbacks and disappointments and so on. That makes us interesting. We're all more complicated than we look. And I think we need to remember that everyone's story is interesting and that's a good enough reason to listen to them when they have something to say. Second thing I'd, I'd say is that in my experience, almost everyone means well. There are such things as bad apples. There are people who've been badly damaged by their early childhood experiences or by some trauma in their lives that's wounded them 
and, and they haven't recovered and they need healing uh, to get back to the person they really are at their core. But for most of us uh, who are not traumatised in that way and not wounded, we do mean well. People are trying to be good partners, good parents, good neighbours, good employees, good citizens, good employers. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing to notice about our species, that basically we are kindly disposed towards each other and we are motivated to make the world a better place. That's an almost universal human experience. When people approach the end of their lives, when they look back, they never say, I wish I'd been busier, I wish I'd made more money or any of that stuff. <clears throat> but if they're, if they're questioning uh, reflectively their lives, they will say, was I kind enough? Did I do well enough? Not just, not, not commercially, did I do well enough as a loving person, as a partner or as a parent or as a neighbour or a friend? So I think that's an indication that deep within, within us we are all trying to do our best, and I find that quite moving. The other thing I'd, I'd say, which is so obvious you may think it's hardly worth saying, but our example is hugely influential. Whether we're talking about our example to our children or our grandchildren or our example to each other in the workplace, in the family, in the neighbourhood, wherever, uh, when we behave kindly, it is much more likely that people who are influenced by that kindness will themselves behave kindly. I don't mean towards me. I'm not acting kindly towards you in the hope that you'll repay me with some kindness. That would be hopeless. That's not kindness. That's self-interest. Um, but if we act kindly towards someone, it is more likely that they will pass it on. Uh, you know, this idea that kindness multiplies is something that I've really observed through my life uh, and I think it's a sobering reminder that when we behave well that has a huge influence on the people around us and of course the converse is true when we behave badly our kids learn how to behave badly yeah. um, even in the midst of a marriage I was talking to someone yesterday in the midst of a marriage breakup you know is it possible to act kindly towards a partner that you're absolutely loggerheads with um, well, if there are kids there, remember the kids. The kids are learning from how you respond to that difficult situation. Uh, they're learning about how humans deal with difficult situations. And if they see bad behaviour, that's the model that they'll follow. Mm. So example is everything. Example is the great teacher. And we're doing it unconsciously all the time. Yeah. Hugh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and for writing the book. It's been an absolute pleasure meeting you through, you know, Zoom. Thank you very much, Louise. It's a pleasure meeting you also, and I hope we can do it properly one day. And there you have it. Another episode of Gatehouse Insights draws to an end. Thank you for watching, and thank you for sharing this video with your friends. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel where you can see more.